Jesus said, I am the resurrection and I am the life. He who believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His compassion never fails. Every morning they are renewed. Jesus said, Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor death, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. If we live, we live to the Lord. And if we die, we die to the Lord. So then, whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord. For to this end, Christ died in liberty, that he might be Lord, both of the dead and of the living. We brought nothing into the world, and we take nothing out. The Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. The eternal God is our refuge, and underneath are his everlasting arms. With faith in Jesus Christ, we receive the body of our sister Thelma for burial. Our sister was washed in holy baptism and anointed with the Holy Spirit. Let us therefore with confidence pray to God our Heavenly Father, the giver of life, that he raise her to perfection in the company of the saints. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. O oh God of grace and glory, we remember before you this day our sister Thelma. We thank you for giving her to us, her family and friends, to know and love as a companion on our earthly pilgrimage. Your boundless compassion, console us for more. Give us faith to see in death the gate of eternal life, so that in quiet confidence, we may continue our course on earth until by your call we are united those who have gone before through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The opening hymn, 497, Blessed Assurance.
kindly be seated. We are going to have the eulogy done by Jackie Walren, followed by a poem by Silta Miller. Good evening, church. Our family first wants to thank all of you sharing with us this evening, the celebration of the life of our mother, Thelma Lernitha Miller. I thought that this was going to be easy, but it isn't. So I just ask you to bear with me. As I looked at my mother yesterday and today when we came up here to the church, and from what everyone was saying to us, she looks beautiful, she looks peaceful. And I said, you know, our mom died the way that she lived, peaceful. She was a peaceful woman. Thelma Lernita Miller was born on the 26th of April, 1941 to Edmund and Mary Walrand. And they lived at Green Hill in St. Michael. However, my grandfather, whom I've never met and whom my mother did not get to know because he died when she was fairly young, He died and her mother took the four children from the marriage, Yvonne, Marlene, my mother who was third, and Roy, down to French Village, St. Peter, by their the aunt. My mother was schooled at the Indian Ground School. She didn't finish school because during that time that my grandmother was in French Village, she had another relationship because she was widowed, she had another relationship, and that produced more children. I think there were about six more, am I correct, auntie? So they were, <laughs> oh, 12 children, sorry, so eight more. And so, my mother then stayed home from school to help take care of her siblings. During my mother's teenage years, and I was told that by her siblings, because they were close, there were a lot of them, but they were close. And they said that she was a hard worker. She looked after them in the absence of their mother who went to work. And at that time then, she then had one of her own children at a fairly early age. She went on and she had five more children. And I know there's a stigma that is associated with young women who have children or a lot of children. There's a stigma that was then and there still is now. But my mother didn't let that phase her. My mother went to work on the plantation. She would pick grass, etc., and she took care of those children. When I think back, because I'm an analytical person and I, I like to look back on history, etc., and I look back and I said to my siblings, I don't ever remember in my lifetime my mother going to any of those fathers for support. She had her children. If the fathers wanted to support them, I guess they probably did. 
I'm not sure, but my mother worked for her children. In 1971, when my mother was working at Warley Plantation, she met a young gentleman. He had come into the island to cut cane, sugar cane, because they used to um, get workers from outside the Caribbean to come and cut the canes. And she met my father back in 1971, and he soon went back to St. Vincent. However, as I was told, my father was not aware that my mother was now pregnant with her seventh child. When someone that was here in the island went back to St. Vincent, they told my dad, look, you, have, you know you have a child here in Barbados? And my father, you know, he told me, when he heard that, he was surprised because back then, they didn't have any technology that they had today. So you either had to write a letter or get a message sent to somebody. And that's what happened. And my dad came back. And in 1973, July the 7th, they got married. They didn't have any money. They didn't have anything. They just got married. As my father said, they didn't even have a glass of wine to toast the wedding. But my mother had one of her siblings who dressed her, who made her dress. Because yes, my mother and her siblings, they were versatile. They, they did a lot of things. Made her dress, dressed her up, and they got married. This is February, the month of Valentine's. And while we may not have seen our parents being so affectionate to each other, you know, and, and, and saying the I love yous and what's not, I've come to a realization that my parents celebrated Valentine. And why I say so is that two of my siblings, the last two, were born in November, all two. And if you do the math, you will see that my mother would have had to conceive in February, so they celebrated Valentine's. So happy Valentine's to my mom and my dad. And while I will say that, even though I was not a love child, born in the month of love, I realized that I was a gift, a birthday gift to my mom because my dad had said that they had met in 1971, and in April, sometime after April, and during April, I'm sorry, they would have hooked up, um, which is a modern word for people that the people say. They would have hooked up, and I was conceived, so. That is in the month of January. I'm happy that my mom was able to see me. I turned 50 in January. So I'm happy that my mom was able to see me reach that milestone. Because you hear on the radio, apart from the older ones who are dying, um, etc., cetera, there's still young ones that are not reaching that age. And I'm thankful that my, my mother and my, my parents and my family was here to celebrate with me. Another thing about my mom was that she was a humble person. She was humble. Again, I said she was peaceful and she was helpful. And she was a philanthropist in her own right. She just didn't have the monies to do that, you know, because People use their monies to help others, etc. But my mother used the gifts that she had to help people. And I remember, my, my siblings can attest to this, that on many occasions, there were people that came to our house 
who didn't have anything to eat. My mother always got the big pot, so people that didn't have anything to eat and they come at our house, they always got to share food. And if there wasn't enough, before my mother shared that food, a piece from everybody was coming out so that that person can get. There were people also that my mother took in, you know, and we had to make room in our house for these people until they were able to go out on their own. And my mother did that without reward. She didn't talk about it or anything. She did it from the goodness of her heart. My mother's house kept other people's children. Apart from all the grandchildren, yes, they always were at grandma's house or mama's house as they call her, but other children were kept there as well. And y'all know who y'all are. To supplement her income from working on the plantation, my mother raised chickens, turkeys, sheep, pigs. And summertime, she would have these animals slaughtered and her children were dressed for school and everything. And one thing I can say about my mom as well, her children never went hungry because my mom, she was like one of those jeweling chefs or just like on Chopped, where you would have a mystery basket and you had to make something from that basket and make a dish. My mother never said she didn't have anything in the house to cook. She would always look and see what she has and make something from that. And in doing so, she was able to feed her children and everything was delicious. All of her grandchildren always loved to eat Mama's food. I was listening to a funeral service recently and they talked about all the alkalads that were given to this person. You know, there was a master and they did a doctorate and they went to this school and, and, and they helped people and what's not. And when I, when I looked at that, when I listened to that, I said, but you know what? That is my mother that they spoke about. She just didn't have all those certificates like the others were talking about. They talked about the person having a voice of an angel. My mother didn't have a voice of an angel, but she carried her own key. And she was a member of the Wem Wesleyan Holiness Choir of which she was a member for as long as I can remember. I'm 50 years old and she's been a member of that church for that long. My mother never let what anybody had affect her. And she always made sure she, tell her, she told her children not to watch what other people have. Work and get your own. And even in getting your own, even in working and, be able, and being able to afford certain things, you might tell yourself, is it necessary? Do with what you have. And if you don't have, do without. Those are the words that I remember constantly from my mother. My mother also told us, respect is due to everyone. Do not look down on anyone and do not look up to anyone. Look up to God. He's the person to look up to. But you give everyone the same respect. She also told us, in being respectful, do not let anyone 
talk down to you or at you. They may have more than you have. Or there may be someone in society in a position. But under God's eyes, they were the same equal as you. And those are the words that carried with me throughout my lifetime. My mother was not a gossiper. And that's the truth. She was a good listener. And she would never come and say to you, well, you need to do this, you need to do that. And she would, she would advise her children, you know, the choice is yours. I'm going to listen to you, but I'm not going to tell you what to do. Whatever choice you make, you have to live with it. My mother was also a trustworthy person. I'm sure there's some of you in here that have told my mother things. Her children, some of her grandchildren, and neither of us, and sorry, not any of us knows what any of us have told our mother because she never came and said, well, Barbara said this, and she told me this, and what's not. So all of that has gone down to the grave with her. And I appreciate my mother for that. We appreciate our mother for that. My mother never forgot those who helped her along the way. She always talked about those who helped her and she was always, whenever, whenever they called and she could help them, even with what little she had, my mother was there. Even in a wheelchair, my mother lost two legs and had a stroke. And my mother was still there giving orders to her children who are adults. And she would say, Go and take this parcel for Emeril. Go and take this parcel for so-and-so. Because some of these same people, they said, if they did not have, they just had to call my mother. And my mother is going to send up a parcel. Yam, cassava, peas, whatever. They had something to cook. And as I said, my mother didn't have any money, but she helped out in every way that she could. And all of her children can attest to that. Whatever little she had, my mother would give her last cent to help any of her children or any of her friends or anyone that came by and needed help and not worry about it. When I look at this verse, my sister would have sent this quote to me. It's by an unknown person. But it says, when our time on this earth is done, money or material things will not matter. But the love time and kindness we've given to others will shine and live on forever. And I know that those of you who are here, who my mother would have helped in any little way, will remember all of those things. My mother loved the Lord. As I said, in 1973, when she married my dad, she also got baptized. And she got baptized too because she wanted to join the Wesleyan Church. And 
And she gave years of service to the church, attendance, or friends. Whenever they had anything at the church, she would make sugar cakes, pawn, conkeys. She would go out and get my father to cut down a hand of bananas. Whatever she had growing at the time, she would donate to the church. She loved the Lord. My mother was not someone who will beat her children or anything like that. She will beat you. Thanks. You will get lashes from my mom if she told you not to do something and you still went ahead and do it. So that was your punishment for being disobedient. My mother was a trooper. In her sickness, she never let it get her down. She would pick right up. Things that we didn't think that our mother would do after losing one leg, two legs, and having a stroke. She did. And she never complained. She would always say she leave it up to God. My mother was a strong woman. Throat is dry. Hmm. My mother was a strong woman, strong at heart and in strength. And on that day that she died, my mother was sitting up. and talking to some of her family because she was about family. And we would all gather together at her house on evenings with my dad. They would come out after taking their nap around two o'clock on evenings and come out in the afternoon and sit with the family and just talk. And that day, she was there with her family after seeing her sister off would come to spend the day with her. She'd eaten her dinner, taken her medication, and then it just happened. But God knows why. My mother was a praying woman, and she prayed for all of her family. And I'm sure that as she was going, she would have said a prayer to God as best as she could at that time with what little time she had. And we know that God was with her at the time. As you can see, she looked peaceful and she was happy. And we thank God for our mother and the time that we would have spent with her. I just want to take a little time to thank again all of you here, thank the people at St. John Funeral Home, All Saints Church for allowing us to have the service and the burial here, Cedric the makeup artist who made up my mother so beautifully and not to have her looking too much because as I said she was a simple woman. Again, 
I'm at a loss for words now, and I'm and I thank you, and have a good evening. Good evening to the church. Thank you all for coming to show your support on behalf of my family. Um, it's just a little something I want to say for all of us. The moment that you died, my heart was torn in two. One side filled with hearty, the other died with you. I often lie awake at night when the world is fast asleep and take a walk down memory lane with tears upon my cheeks. Remembering you is easy. I do it every day. But missing you is heartache that never goes away. I hold you tightly within my heart and there you will remain until the joyous day arrives that we will meet again. So when tomorrow starts without me, please try to understand that an angel came and called her name and took her by the hand. The angel said her place was ready in heaven far above and that I'd have to leave behind all those I dearly love. But when she walked through heaven's gates, she felt so much at home when God looked down and smiled at her and told her, welcome home. So when tomorrow starts without her, don't think that she's far apart. For every time we think of her, she's right here in our heart. Thank you. We will now have the first Bible reading given by Maureen Walden. We will not have, good evening. We will not have you, brethren, concerning those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as others do, who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so through Jesus, God will bring within those who have fallen asleep. For this we declare to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the com coming of the Lord shall not perceive those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of a commandment with the archangel calling and with the sound of the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, shall be caught up together with them in the cloud to meet the Lord in the air. And so we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Amen. Psalm 24, we are going to read the verses alternately. 
The earth is the Lord's and all that therein is, the compass of the world and they that dwell therein. Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord, or who shall rise up in his holy place? He shall receive the blessing from the Lord, and righteousness from the God of his salvation. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be ye lift up, be ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be ye lift up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Rest eternal grant unto her, and let light perpetual shine upon her. We'll now have the second reading being done by Akila Harding. The Bible reading is taken from John chapter 14, verses 1 to 6. Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many homes, are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go, if, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. That is where I am, and there ye may also, and there ye may be also. And whither I go, ye know, and the way ye know. Thomas saith unto him, Lord, we know not whether thou goest, and, thou, and how can we know the way? Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the light. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Here ends the Bible reading. The hymn before the sermon, 491, What a Friend We Have in Jesus.
Lord, make me to know my end and the measure of my days, what it is that I may know how frail I am. I speak to you this evening in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. You may be seated. I take this opportunity to express appreciation to the minister in charge, our Reverend Selvin Law, for according me the privilege to speak and to share God's word with you in this service of thanksgiving. I further acknowledge the parliamentary representative in the person of Minister Colin Jordan, who has come to join us in this service of celebration. My theme for this evening's homily is taken from Psalms 39, and I read to you previously verse 4. King David is here expressing himself as it relates to what he calls the vanity of life. Psalm 39 really captures the sentiments of his heart as he gives his assessment of life as lived here on earth. He is looking back in time at the exploits and conquests as well as those of everyone around him. Remember, he's a king. He sees men like some sort of great phantoms who possess a lot of noise, beat their chests, and amass a lot of riches. However, after all the dust is settled, at the end of his life and all the pursuits that were in vain, because he will leave this earth and have no idea who will gather them or end up with his possessions, he concentrates here on the legacy. What will I leave behind? Here, King David is telling the Lord that since that everything that is in this life is mere vanity and that his true home and citizenship is really in heaven that since his hope is really in the Lord he does not want to wait any longer to pass from this life and to be with the Lord you're realizing that he is really at the end of life. David realized that his hope must be in God alone. Placing your hope in anything else is just going to let you down. I can concur with the writer of the song who said, my hope is built on nothing less but Jesus Christ and his righteousness. We can sometimes place our hopes in the answer to the prayers we pray rather than the Lord. And when we do that, we often get frustrated and vexed when things we hope for fall true. Have you had that experience? Our hope must be in God alone. Even in those things we are praying for to meet our needs, when we do not get the answer. Remember, sometimes the answer is wait. In essence, 
It appears that David is saying here that he wants to be purified from sinful acts and motives so that he can be a good witness to those who don't know the Lord in hope that they might see the glory of God and the desire to know him because of what they see in his life. Brethren, we are living epistles that are to be known by all men. That is what he meant when he said, Deliver me from all my transgressions. Make me not the reproach of the foolish. Are you aware that when we are in our last days, our last moments, people are quick to listen to what we say? Our last words really attract the attention undividedly. Those who then represent the Lord Jesus in this world must know that death and life is in the power of the tongue. And if you notice, when you read the 39th Psalm at its very commencement, David is very conscious of the fact that he wants to control his tongue while the wicked is before him. Taste your words before you speak them. They are like feathers thrown, thrown from the attic window. You cannot retrieve them. And so if we are going to be real representatives of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, we have to, like Job, remember how forceful are right words. About the tongue. Have you read this? With the tongue we bless God. And by the very self-same token, we curse men. Brethren, the word of God says to us, these things ought not so to be. David shows how transitory each person's life is in this world, including his. He is not looking to subjects or slaves, nor servants. His focus in this 39th Psalm is on God. We are here for a short time, and the language he employs says it's by the hand breath. It's by the breath. In a wishful moment, we are gone. David writes, Every man is a mere breath. So life is like a walking shadow that struts and frets his horror upon the stage. And guess what? And then it's heard no more. Trials and difficulties do not come to us as punishment from the Lord. Sometimes we believe that. Sometimes other people tell us so. But as a tender discipline of a loving father who is trained to help us to see and live by the higher principles. We are all called to be partakers of what I'm calling a divine life source and live a life that is abundant because it flows from God from whom all blessings flow. One of the grave tests of our existence, especially in our years of affliction, happens to do with how we behave ourselves, what we say, how we say it. People are watching us, friends. David, I admire greatly for his patience in his trials. Many people remember things about him that were sinful, but if you put your head in the Psalms, you can find great admonition. Did you remember the words he spoke 
when my heart is overwhelmed. Lead me to the rock that is higher than I. It doesn't matter what stations of life we fill, there comes a point in time that sickness and affliction test the truth of our witness. David is simply saying, Lord, show me how frail I am. Very often we think ourselves, we have achieved much in this world, and we shred like peacocks, speaking of our place and position, pride of place and position. David, as a king, is saying, Lord, help me to have what I call an ornament of a gracious spirit. The words of the Apostle Paul ably defines our sister departed, known her for so long a while. Quiet demeanor. Easily spoken. She seemed to have had it all thought out and thought through. I saw her like Barnabas as an encourager. I guess what? As life changed and her body was no longer the same, amputations one after the next. She sat in her chair, the wheelchair, in the back of the church, as composed as any other member. Never fretful. On the other hand, never fearful. Here lies a saint. Who knew who she believed? And was fully persuaded, legs or no legs, faith in health or good health. He is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. So if you really want to see your people, see them in Affliction Valley, the Valley of Baca. How they can transform it. And they can so displace such an excellent spirit, a gracious spirit. That is what David is talking about. This pastor, on the behalf of the members at the Wim Wesleyan Church and my sister church, the Crab Hill Wesleyan Holiness Church. We certainly want to say to your husband, her husband, the children, the Miller and Waldron families, we certainly admire you finding quality time as caregivers not placing her in any home. No, that's the style now. But taking turns and serving her who served you. And I think that made her happy. That made her happy. I want to commend Silta and her brother interchangeably at different Sundays taking time out to bring her to the sanctuary where she could connect and reconnect with the sitting body in worship. You see, these acts of kindness will not go unrewarded. And I want to say to you, Brother Miller and family, daily we made prayers for this family. And I speak to the wider audience. 
those of you who are looking after your elderly, I work in the Ministry of Social Transformation, now called Elder Affairs. When you are taken out of active duty because of your caregiving for your elderly, see it as a ministry. It's a ministry of health. And I remembered well when Jesus in the book of Matthew 25 spoke to those who were questioned as concerning their stewardship. This is what Jesus said. Listen. For as much as you've done it unto the least of these, my by the way, you have done it unto me. So indeed and in truth, all of you who played that pivotal role in making the late Thelma Miller happy, you indeed were God's hands extended, reaching out to the oppressed. I take this moment to expend my deepest sympathy on behalf of my servant family and the church family at the Whim and Crab Hill. May she rest in peace and rise in glory. Amen. Let us all stand and reaffirm our faith. The words of the Apostles' Creed on page 100 and on page 5. On page 5. Together we say, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit, he was born of the Virgin Mary suffered on the Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended in death. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge even and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of sins, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Lord have mercy. Christ have mercy. Lord have mercy. Together we say the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive them who trespass against us. And lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Grant us, Lord, the wisdom and the grace to use aright the time that is left to us here on earth. Lead us to repent of our sins, the evil we have done, and the good we have failed to do. And strengthen us to follow the steps of your Son in the way that leads to the fullness of eternal life, through Jesus Christ, O oh Lord. Amen. Let us commend our sister Thelma Lernita to the mercy of God, our Maker and Redeemer. Heavenly Father, by your mighty power, you have given us new life in Christ Jesus. We entrust Thelma Lernita to your merciful Keeping. In the faith of Jesus Christ, your Son, O oh Lord, who died and rose again to save us, and is now alive and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit in glory forever. Amen. Rest eternal grant unto her, O oh Lord. May she and all the faithful departed to the mercy of God rest in peace and rise in glory. Let me take this opportunity on behalf of the parish family here, all saints, to 
extend our deepest condolences to the family, friends, and close associates of our dear sister, Thelma. We here continue to remember you in our prayers that God will continue to strengthen you and give you faith and courage as you deal with the days that are ahead. I also want to acknowledge the presence of the Honorable Minister Colin Jordan and also want to thank our brother, Reverend Audrey Oney, for bringing the message as well. We now sing the hymn, How Great Thou Art. And during this hymn, a collection be taken, which be used for the continual work here at All Saints. How Great Thou Art.
let us thy, thou thy servant depart in peace according to thy word for mine eyes have seen thy salvation which thou hast prepared before the face of thy people Let us pray. Man born of a woman has but a short time to live. Like a flower, he blossoms and then withers. Like a shadow, he flees and never stays. In the midst of life, we are in death. To whom can we turn for help but to you, Lord, who are justly angered by our sins? Lord God, holy and mighty, holy and immortal, holy and most merciful Savior, deliver us from the bitter pains of eternal death. You know the secrets of our hearts. In your mercy, hear our prayer. Forgive our sins, and at our last hour, let us not fall away from you. Ensure and certain hope of resurrection to eternal life through our Lord Jesus Christ. We commend to Almighty God our sister Thelma Lernitha, and we commit her body to the ground, earth to earth, ashes to ashes, dust to dust. And we beseech you in your infinite goodness to give us grace to live in your dear love and to die in your favor, that when your well beloved Son shall come again in judgment. Both this, our sister Thelma, Lernitha, and we ourselves may be found acceptable in your sight. Grant this for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Almighty God, with whom still live the spirits of those who die in the Lord, and with whom the souls of the faithful are in joy and felicity, we give you heartfelt thanks for the good examples of all your servants who, having finished their course in faith, now find rest and refreshment. May we, with all who have died in the true faith of your holy name, have perfect fulfillment and bliss in your eternal and everlasting glory. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Grant, O Lord, to all who are bereaved the spirit of faith and courage, that they may have strength to meet the days to come with steadfastness and patience, not sorrowing as those without hope, but in thankful remembrance of your great goodness and in the joyful expectation of eternal life with those they love. And this we ask in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Unto God's most gracious mercy and protection we commit her. The Lord bless her and keep her. The Lord make his face shine upon her and be gracious unto her. The Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon her 
and give her his peace now and forevermore. Amen.
Precious Lord, take my hand, lead me on, let me stand. I am tired, I am weak, I am worn. Through the storm, through the night, lead me on to Precious Lord, and lead me home. When my way 
precious Lord, take my hand, lead me on, let me stand. I am tired, I am weak, I am worn. Through the storm, through the night, lead me on to Precious Lord, and lead me home. When my way grows dear, precious Lord, linger near. When my life is almost gone, hear my cry. Let us pray. Go before us, Lord, in all our doings with your most gracious favor, and further us with your continual help, that in all thy work begun, continue, and ended in thee, may continue to glorify your holy name, and finally, by your mercy, obtain everlasting life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Go in peace, and continue to serve the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you peace. And give you peace and give you peace. And give you peace, the Lord
Thomas children, grandchildren, great-grands. I will let you all to come.